Dr. Weaver served as Canada Research Chair in Climate Modeling and Analysis in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria. He was a lead author in the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, second, third, fourth, and fifth scientific assessments. <clears throat> Dr. Weaver is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Canadian Meteorological and Oceanographic Society, American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Meteor excuse me, and the Ameri American Meteorological Society. Wow, that's a tough word. <laughs> over and over and over. Dr. Weaver was appointed to the Order of British Columbia in 2008 and awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2013. Dr. Weaver made the shift from science to politics to use his background in science, policy, and the community to offer vital perspectives to strengthen our province in the future. Dr. Weaver. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for, for being here and for inviting me again to what's got to be one of my uh, favorite conferences, the Generate Conference. There's so many like-minded people in here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about clean energy in BC as the opportunity as I see it. And this will be my very last talk at uh, a Generate or my very last attendance at a Generate Conference as a leader of BC Greens, as our party is going through a transition, and there will be a new leader uh, moving forward. And so. I look forward to staying in touch as my, in my capacity when I uh, return to the University of Victoria as I'm going to teach as a professor in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences and I will go back uh, one day. So what I want to do here is, is kind of present the opportunity. Every single environmental challenge in my view is nothing more than an opportunity for innovation and global warming is no different. Uh, sadly uh, and unfortunately uh, many seem to think of this as a grand problem as opposed to an incredible opportunity. So what is the so-called problem? Well, the problem, of course, is the world is warm, despite the fact that something like 40% of Republicans in the US believe there still isn't strong evidence that the, uh, the Earth is warming. The evidence is very clear. We know, for example, uh, that the, the most recent years of warming are, are, are stark and dramatic in terms of both the historical record as well as even in long-term paleo uh, proxy records as well. And in fact, um, just last week, the American Meteorological Society published the state of the climate system for 2018. They do that every year, and it turned out 2018 was the fourth warmest year. Oh, that must mean global cooling, because it was warmer a couple of years before. That's the kind of political narrative that's out there. Also, it pointed out that uh, January to September of this year is the second warmest on record. But more importantly, when you take a look at this curve on the bottom, which is a little difficult to see where you are, what it is is showing global ocean heat uh, content. And why that's important is that that is a critical measure as to whether or not there's a good understanding of the radiation balance at the top of the atmosphere. Because we know how much the atmosphere is warmed. We know it has a very small heat capacity. When we know how much the ocean is warmed, and we've had direct measurements at the top of the atmosphere in terms of incoming and outgoing radiation, we should be able to do an energy balance. And indeed, that is what's found, is that the warming, the, the net radiation balance is manifesting itself in the curve at the bottom, which is the increase in ocean heat content, in particular in the upper, upper 700, 1200 meters. So that is going up too, and that's an, impo that's an important thing to remember. Because think of the world as a pot of water on a stove, where the stove element is actually the radiative imbalance at the top of the atmosphere. When you turn the stove element on, what happens, of course, is the water sometimes starts to slowly warm. By the time the water is at a temperature that you don't like and you turn the stove element down, because of the high heat capacity of that water, it doesn't cool right away. And it's the same thing in the Earth's system is that as the water warms, it means that the warming will reside for a very, very long time. And I'll frame that in terms of a question of intergenerational equity uh, in the future. The same is true for carbon dioxide emissions, and I'll come to that. Going back to the, what happened in the last year, there'd be more, more positive and fewer negative temperature extremes in 2018 worldwide, uh, and more so than nearly every other year in the 64-year uh, record that existed. Global mass balance of the world's glaciers, not ice sheets, he's just focusing on glaciers. 
uh, is, uh, for the Alpine glaciers is such that the average Alpine glacier lost a meter in 2018. And it has lost 28, 24 meters in elevation since 1980. And many of these have now passed the point of no return in that feedbacks, whether it be through a soot deposition or a lapse rate feedbacks are such that they will all melt, including most of the um, Alpine glaciers in British Columbia this century. We know that the globally average carbon dioxide level is 407.4, average through the whole year, and it was up 2.4 parts per million from the year before, and that there's actually continued signs of permafrost increase. So I'm framing this at, uh, as a very serious, serious problem, and then I'll talk about the opportunity. So before I got into politics, one of the focuses we had, or my lab had at the University of Victoria, was the development of something known as an Earth System Climate Model. The purpose of that is to try to represent the feedbacks in the climate system as best as possible with the most accurate physics you can actually get to represent them on the time scales and spatial scales of relevance to the climate problem. Obviously, uh, for example, if we're doing numerical weather prediction, predicting weather out three or four days, we don't really, really care what the deep ocean is doing because it's not relevant on that time scale. However, on longer time scales, what matters is the statistics of weather as opposed to uh, perhaps what's happening on any given day. And, and as such, we built this, this climate model, which was you know, quite extensively used around the world. It includes uh, organic and vegetation components as well. But why I'm showing this is I come back to the previous and the last statement here about permafrost. And this is, I'll, I'll, I'll move on as, we move, as the talk progresses into the Paris Accord. But why this is important to touch upon the permafrost one now is that there is not a single climate model in the world whose projections up to date in terms of climate policy making have included carbon feedbacks associated with the melting of permafrost. The next assessment will have some. But we did some because we have an exploratory tool. We took a look at this in. 2013, or sorry, not 2013, it was in 2011. And we made a hypothetical um, scenario, what if experiment. Suppose hypothetically, every single source of carbon dioxide in the world that's anthropogenic or human produced was turned off with a switch in 2013. What would happen to the global temperate atmospheric level of carbon dioxide and as a direct consequence the global atmospheric, or sorry, the global surface temperature. <clears throat> so let's suppose we turn off the emissions in 2013. Well, what we know is that the response of the climate system, and in particular the response of the permafrost, will be dependent on what's known as climate sensitivity. Now, climate sensitivity, by definition, is the single most important metric explaining our collective scientific understanding of global warming. It is this. How much will the world warm if we double atmospheric carbon dioxide levels? The first estimate goes back to Svantar Henius in 1896. Since 1979, when the first coupled models were assessed, the range has been one and a half to four and a half degrees, and it hasn't changed. So we've had tens of thousands of papers. This fundamental metric is still somewhere between one and a half and four and a half degrees. So what we said is the following. Okay, we don't know what climate sensitivity is. It's a range between one and a half and four. What if the climate sensitivity is four? What if it's three? What if it's one? And what you're then able to do is use a model like the one we built here to assess the, um, the response to the climate system. And the summary is this. In all simulations where the climate sensitivity was greater than three, the permafrost carbon feedback is self-sustaining. So what that means is because it's warm, you get a permafrost thawing which creates decomposition of organic matter in the absence or presence of oxygen to produce uh, methane or carbon dioxide, and that's the greenhouse gas, which then warms further. But if the response of the system to greenhouse gas increases is smaller, then eventually you see kind of a stabilization of the atmospheric carbon dioxide level. So at three degrees, nothing much happens. It's like it takes thousands of years to draw down naturally existing atmospheric carbon dioxide. But the, the worry and the concern is, okay, these, none of these have been accounted for. So <coughs> we're starting to, to suggest that, in fact, um, you know, we're going to make one and a half degrees Paris commitment, and we're ignoring things like permafrost carbon feedback, which almost certainly will add 0.2 to 0.3 degrees warming, at least uh, in the next century or so. We have a bit of a disconnect between science and policy. Come back to that. 
The Arctic, well the Arctic didn't set a record uh, this year. Uh, the September minimum uh, tied for the second lowest in, uh, with lowest was in 2012. Uh, the September average was the uh, average over all days was uh, uh, third lowest on record. Uh, lowest was 2012, and the second lowest was 2007. So nothing has really changed. You know, we've a lot of talk about um, climate, and a lot of students protesting, uh, and the system just moves on each and every year. Now I've I've used this slide before in talks that generate us uh, generate uh, generate conferences. And the reason why I'll put it up again is just to frame this entire problem then as to one involved really intergenerational equity. And that was shown back in this uh, early 2000s um, uh, IPCC assessment report that showed under a variety of, of projected scenarios for future emissions growth, benign, business as usual, that's historical business as usual, um, prior to the industrialization of Asia, and this is the present path we're on now, and you ask the question, okay, given tech, given uh, infrastructure, social economic inertia, inertia in that we're not gonna be tear, tear down a coal plant today immediately and replace it by a windmill tomorrow. There's inertia in our social in, in our infrastructure, in our social economic uh, institutions. Given that the, the scenarios are this, over the next couple of decades, the climate warming in store is relatively insensitive to the policy decisions we make today. The reason why, of course, if we make up today a policy decision to eliminate coal in, as, a, as, a, as a means of producing electricity, that's fine. Um, that process, the turnaround of those coal, coal, coal plants is not going to be overnight. There's an inertia in that. But what, so what we have in store is about 0.2 degrees per decade warming independent of policy decisions or rather, or rather uh, emissions trajectories in store over the next couple of decades. This was the details are here. It's, 2020 to 2029 um, relative to uh, uh, warming relative to uh, three different scenarios to the average over 1980 to 19, uh, However, at the end of the century, we have a profoundly different world depending on the policy decisions we make today because it takes time for our infrastructure to overturn. And so, for example, in a relatively benign growth of emissions, we're in a two degree world at the end of the century a relatively maintained status quo, we're at a four degree world. And this figure, of course, was done in about 2001, so these numbers are hopelessly out of date, but the, the point that stands still there is that the issue of global warming is really not relevant to me, or to many of those like me in there with gray hair. Because no matter what we do today, the manifestation of that policy is not gonna affect us in our lifetime. However, it has a profound importance on what the next generation and the generation thereafter inherit. So fundamentally, the issue of global warming is, boils down to one question, or rather whether we deal with it or not. Do we, the present generation, owe anything to future generations in terms of the quality of the environment we leave behind? Yes or no? If no, who cares about this problem? If yes, if yes, then we must act now. Why should we care, and why should we care Obviously, if you care about intergenerational equity, that's a big deal. But in fact, on that note, you know, species. So do we have a value on species? Do we care if 40 to 60% of all world species become committed to extinction this century? Is that a value statement? If the answer is yes, we need to start dealing with this. Do we care about geopolitical instability? You can have two reactions. One is no, we'll hunker down and build walls around our nation and, and protect ourselves from the, from the others. But this issue will create profound geopolitical instability and already has committed to profound geopolitical instability as a direct consequence of warming and hence sea level rise that is in store as we try to equilibrate to the existing levels of greenhouse gases. And so how have the world's policymakers responded? What I'm showing here is a graph, it's, it's not as big as I would have liked, a graph of global carbon emissions in gigatons from 1750 through to the year 2015 or something like that. And on those, I put a number of arrows. I'll make this available on my website later. Arrow number one says Fourier. That's Fourier, that's in the uh, um, 1820s or 1816, I can't remember the exact year. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier for the engineers in the crowd and the mathematicians, obviously Fourier analysis, was the first to recognize the greenhouse effect, and that the atmosphere was transparent to incoming solar radiation, but very effective at acting like a blanket by 
um, absorbing long wave. We've got Tyndall, first person to measure the different absorptive properties of different gases in the 1860s. Uh, Arrhenius did some uh, first <laughs> estimate of climate sensitivity. George Callender, first multi-century predictions. Ravel talked about the importance of, uh, of, of mitigating emissions because of the effect of ocean acidity. We've got Manabi and Broker, the first coupled ocean atmosphere modeling results. We've got some important conferences, the World Climate Conference and, and Jules Charney in 1979 with the very first national assessments. The IPCC first assessment, second assessment. We've got Kyoto up there in the protocol in 1997. The third assessment, the fourth assessment. We have the Copenhagen uh, Accord in 2009, the fifth assessment report, and the, and the Paris Accord. And despite a lot of political record, rhetoric going back decades, emissions have not slowed down at all. In fact, the Paris Agreement, so I'm painting this picture of doom and gloom, you know, that's totally out of this. Um, in fact, the, the Paris Agreement, which says this, holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. That's one of the overarching goals, to, uh, to, to keep global um, temperatures well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to limit to one and a half degrees. But I can tell you, um, well, scientifically and politically, this is destined to be a failure. And the reason why it's destined to be a failure is single-handedly going down to this, is that the key players are not actually in the room. If there is a jurisdiction like you, like Canada that goes that goes completely and gets excited, or let's say British Columbia, increases the carbon price, starts to completely transform its economy to be electrified, et cetera, et cetera, then we start to worry about, you know, we have an orchard growing industry in the Okanagan where they're getting priced out because of, of, um, of carbon pricing, and then so we're going to start realizing we're seeing more and more New Zealand apples showing up in our, in our, in our um, grocery stores because the cost of keeping our BC apples stored to the spring when we, when we want them is expensive, especially with carbon tax, et cetera. Well, then New Zealand now, can, if they've gone rogue and haven't decided, decided to do nothing, they have a competitive advantage, their apple growers over ours. They're not internalizing the externality that we internalize here. So the only response that British Columbia would, could have there would be to, well, they have no response, would be for Canada to put import tariffs on the boundaries of our nation for those jurisdictions that have not put some form of climate pricing in. And as soon as that happened, you go to end up in the international courts, as that being you know, anti-dumping legislation and so forth. It's, it's a problem. Continuing on that problem, the IPCC uh, uh, recent report on keeping global warming to one and a half degrees is very complex. They still haven't learned, after I mean, I've been involved in them since the early 1990s, they still haven't learned that a summary for policymakers does not mean you have to have a PhD in atmospheric science to understand. This figure was embedded out of the uh, summary from policymakers, but to be perfectly blunt, there's not a single policymaker I know that would actually understand this figure because it's 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 complex in terms of uh, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, you will understand it because you're all practicing people in the field. But what it essentially says is this. We know, it, it, we know that the, 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 what matters in terms of, well, I'm going to say it mathematically, delta T over C is constant, where delta T is the projected equal warming that will occur, and C is the cumulative impact of carbon. And the reason why is because the sinks are relatively slow uh, in terms of, 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 of the response. So we have delta T over C, meaning that we can then determine budgets, how much the world is going to warm, we can then calculate the carbon budget we have to put into the atmosphere to keep the warming below some threshold with some probability. That's been work that's been around for about a decade now. So that's important because then what the IPCC group did is summarize based on a variety of assumptions, this will come back in a second. Um, we'll just get this back up here. So a variety of assumptions, a bunch of possible trajectories to keep the warming below one and a half degrees, none of which include a bit of carbon feedback. And so the answer is basically the world needs to be to essentially decarbonize, go zero in uh, mid-century, and become negative, and this is important, 
We're not talking about emissions to zero, we're talking about getting negative emissions as well. So the notion, given that the world is warmed by about one degree already, and given that we know that we have a commitment warming of about 0.6 degrees, if we do no more than keep existing levels of greenhouse gases fixed, that brings us to 1.6. And we know that the permafrost feedback, carbon feedback will give us another 0.2 to 0.3. We know that we're at 1.8, 1.9, assuming we start the path to decarbonization now. And so, in summary, and to be perfectly blunt, it's folly to think that we will keep the world to one and a half degrees worth warming. And one of the things that I find most disconcerting in politics is when people stand up and say that we're doing this, and you can show that you're simply not. In fact, I would say forget about two degrees. We're now all hands on deck to limit global warming to three degrees. And that will have very profound effects on our climate system. We're taking, in a matter of a few decades, the climate system to a place it has not been in millions upon millions of years. Very difficult for species to adapt to that. Now that I painted this picture of doom and gloom, this is a model that I've always lived by. Climate change actually presents the greatest opportunity for innovation, creativity, and prosperity the world has ever seen. In fact, every single environmental challenge should be viewed as an opportunity for innovation, and climate change is no different. And instead of dwelling on the hopelessness, and this is the work that takes so long to try to get people to start thinking, instead of dwelling on the hopelessness of the problem, focus on the excitement of de developing the solutions. And to address the issues for innovation, I believe they fall into two categories for, that's relevant to you. Um, reducing emissions, obviously, and negative emissions. And I'll come to both of these in a second. But I want to put a cautionary note here. Has anyone seen this book by Nancy Gurney, King of Mice and the Cheese? It's a cautionary, cautionary note that I'm attaching to negative emissions, and a cautionary, even more cautionary note to other geoengineering ideas that have been put forward. There will be a technological fix to this problem. And this is a little a book that I, when I go into uh, elementary school kids, I read out. And I ask, now, and the book goes like this. It's a story about a king who loves cheese. He loves it so much that his castle gets infested with mice. And so he calls in his wise advisors and says, what do I do? And they say, ah, bring in cats to get rid of mice. So they bring in cats, they get rid of the mice, and now the castle is infested with cats. So the advisors come in and advise bringing in dogs next. And so they do, and guess what? the castles infested with dogs. And so they go back out and think about how to deal with that problem. They bring in lions. And of course, the lions are infesting the castle until they bring in elephants to get rid of the lions. And then they've got these elephants breaking walls, so they go right back and bring mice in again to get rid of the elephants. But it doesn't end there. The king then asks his wise advisors, what are we going to do? And his wise advisors come up with only one solution. Now I tell you, when I read this book to kids, each and every time, without fail, the kids say, stop eating the cheese, <laughs> right? But that's not what the advisors say. The advisors say, oh look, we have to learn how to share our cheese with the mice. I mean, it's a wonderful metaphor for climate change mitigation, adaptation, the perils of geoengineering, and actually what the real problem is. The real problem, is emissions of greenhouse gases. I'll come to that. So for the last number of years in the BC legislature, it's been a tough slog, I gotta be honest, it's a tough slog, but I was very pleased that government is now starting to see the opportunity in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. And that was manifested in Clean BC. I saw there was a, um, a booth out there, I encourage you to, to get information on that. Now, Clean BC is but a first step. It's a great acronym, it's got some great uh, ideas in it, but it is but a first step. A first step to reduce emissions to 40% below 2007 levels by 2030, of which identified policy measures will take us 75% of the way, assuming the modeling was done with the correct assumptions and also assuming that there's no new surprises. Both of which are questionable assumption. But with that said, as an optimist looking for the opportunity, I see two great opportunities in this, particularly for BC. One is 
Electrification of everything. And what do I mean by that? We started to hear the words coming out of the Premier. He talked about a clean energy grid initiative with BC and Washington. Again, a lot of good words. And I do, I have a very good relationship with the Premier and I do believe he's committed to doing this. Where there's gonna be a 2020 clean grid summit. Again, we're waiting for the details on this, but these are positive direction. We've heard it all before, but at least we're seeing a positive direction. And I'm gonna be blunt and honest. There is absolutely no room for LNG or any other expansion of full fossil fuel infrastructure if we wish to meet our BC or international targets. Who believe the folly that somehow Canada is going to change, uh, is going to save China from themselves, are deluding themselves to think that this is somehow a solution to global warming. Paris is very clear. Effective immediately, there can be no new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure if we're going to transition to, car to carbon neutrality. Because you do not invest in new infrastructure to actually tear it down a decade from now. If we are going to deal with these, this problem, each and every one of those new investments will become stranded assets and will behold the, the shareholders who double down into those. And you can see it already. And I look at the, 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 what happened in LNG Canada. Can you imagine your industries here? If you got the scale of subsidy, how many windmills get exempted from steel tax? Probably not a lot of them. How many of you have to royalty well, the royalty regimes different with water licenses get hacked down to essentially give them away so that you have more on the books in some years recently? We have more accrued liability by future royalty credits added to the books than we actually get as a, as a money. And how many of you would like to get your electricity at a discount rate? How many of you would like to be exempt from the carbon tax increases? It's just remarkable at the scale of, of subsidy that these dying industries are getting while the up and coming sectors, the sectors that actually bode well for our future societies. You talk about the need for actually subsidy. I don't think your industries need subsidy. What they need is the subsidies to be taken away from those that are continuing to pollute. So that is the opportunity to do number one. Here's a great example. Let's look at the elect what happened when we introduced the zero emission vehicle standard in British Columbia. In 2016, prior to that, there was a total of 5,434 um, registered zero emitting vehicles in BC, according to ICBC. 2017, it went to 8,763, 30% increase. 2018, a 96% increase. In fact, 2019 to September, it's gone up another 82%. That's the kind of stock growth, capital growth that I invest in. But it seems like governments are still at all strikes thinking that we should be investing in the opposite. You know, I, it's like investing in Nortel when it's hit 30 bucks, thinking it's a great deal. So I, I look at this, and I can say that after the introduction of the zero, zero emission vehicle standard, 15% of all new cars sold in British Columbia in the first quarter were zero emitting vehicles. That's already blown away our 2025 ZS, ZS target. 15% in the first quarter. That's innovation, and that's how the market responds to innovation, uh, and that's how we have the potential to, to actually take advantage of this. You know, BC Hydro, they've, I, mean, I won't try to justify their um, forecast and projections. In essence, their production's been flat. Uh, as they claim it will go up, another mill closes, so demand is going down. There's so BC Hydro has not really, um, ready to actually meet the potential demand of things like the electrification of our society. But more importantly, here's, the, here's opportunity number two, and I think it's one that a lot of people haven't put their heads around yet too. If we look at 800,000 year ice core records of atmospheric CO2, very accurate records because the air is actually trapped in the ancient ice. And you look at the highest level that we've ever had in at least, well certainly in the existence of Homo sapiens, but even likely going back almost you know, 20 million years, but certainly high resolution data in the last 800,000 years. The highest level of carbon dioxide was around 300 parts per minute. We're already at 407, not counting methane and nitrous oxide and, and all the hydrocarbon, I mean, uh, 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 CFCs and HFCs. So we're already way up on it. And that's the, the, the bit at the end here. One of the things we'll have to do as well, if we care about this problem, is obviously adapt, but also start thinking about innovation in negative emissions. 
To reduce the atmosphere of carbon dioxide by one part per million per year requires about almost five gigatons of negative emissions per year. That's about, it's a little over half, about half what we're putting out. And the reason why this is, is so high is that there's two feedbacks that come in to make it more difficult to take the emissions up to the, the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. One is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide between the ocean and the atmosphere changes, and the oceans start to outgas some of that carbon dioxide that is now stored there. And also the terrestrial uh, carbon sink becomes less effective. So this opportunity for innovation, when looking at obviously for larger in the global carbon cycle, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can actually uh, take the uh, process of trying to increase natural removal processes or decrease natural emission processes. Some of which are natural removal processes, a state trees growing, of course. Others are chemical weathering, when you have carbonic acid in water fall on, on various rocks, you can actually take the carbon dioxide uh, over very long time scales. If you could speed that up, that would be a good thing. And there's really seven, seven types of withdrawal of negative emission uh, scenarios that are being discussed. Aforestation, reforestation, obviously not so relevant to this audience. But since about one third of cumulative global emissions have come from deforestation, you might imagine that uh, a significant fraction of that could come back from deforestation, or reforestation, and afforestation. Biochar, it's a very exciting area, of, uh, I'm certain area, the, the use of putting in soils, the uh, carbon in the form of basically charcoal to both enhance vegetation growth as well as to store it there. Soil capture through changes in, in agricultural te techniques has the potential to produce some negative emission. Synthetic weathering, that's, that's speeding up, um, very uh, energy intensive, uh, trying to speed up the natural uh, chemical weathering process. Um, ocean fertilization is a bit like king of mice and the cheese, but the blue carbon has some, has some potential through uh, seagrasses and others. So these are being explored. But more importantly, ones that are ready and now that I think we have the great potential are, where it's where you have traditional carbon capture and storage, which is often solely used for enhanced oil recovery. The idea is, as we're seeing in some organizations, we have one very well-known one in Squamish, is the direct air capture sequestration, or DACS as it's called. Direct air capture sequestration has potential, not if it's just gonna remove more uh, enhanced oil recovery, but if you're actually storing the recovered carbon uh, that's sequestered in the ground, and perhaps one of the easiest and most efficient ways of creating negative emissions is through something called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. That is growing fast growing crops, burning them to create energy and then burying that, in, that resulting carbon dioxide underground. So these are the two, in my view, the two exciting areas of innovation that exist in the energy sector. One is in the, in the, in the production of, uh, uh, sorry, is to reducing you know, widespread re reduction of fossil fuel emissions. And the other is in terms of energy use for new technologies involved in negative emissions. So I would argue uh, that the future is actually still very bright here in British Columbia for clean energy, despite what we've seen in recent years. And that is my commitment to this audience, is I won't be an MLA for much longer, but while I'm still an MLA, I've decided all my efforts are going to try to work on the electrification aspects of this problem. Uh, as, of the, the, uh, as of this past, this upcoming session, I'm less interested, I'm moving away from any partisan role and just really trying to go all in to uh, help with the electrification because we have so much to offer here in British Columbia, not the least of which is our access to renewable resources that is second to none in the world and if we can't do it here, how else can anyone else do it? Because we have people, innovation, stable uh, education, the beautiful place to live, and the natural resources. And with that, I thank you for your attention.